Uh, let's get you caught up on the markets uh, at this hour. Joining us now for that is John Lynch, Chief Investment Strategist at LPL Financial. And here on set is David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer of the Bonson Group. Uh, and um, like, a, a, like a brother from a different mother, when I read the stuff that you're saying here, David, that, that I'm afraid to, to say in public, really. I, yeah, I, I can tell you're afraid to say it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> You remain overwhelmingly pro Brexit. Of course. Even if it was a, just a clean, even if it was a with 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 not a deal, just get out. Went since and you say this. it's entirely unnecessary. But if that's what it took, is a hard Brexit, it would be superior to the alternative. I don't think it's going to come to that. But Why are you? There, there's people that think the you know most people that have a, a horse in the game, and I'm talking yeah. about blank fine or you know previously they they look at brexit like it's like it's the end of the world the end of globalism you say when is freedom a bad thing for me it's like how can one of the greatest empires in the world the uk how can they cede all that control to, to bureaucrats unelected bureaucrats in, in belgium how how would that ever make sense? It's, it's not a rhetorical question. I, I've asked the same question to some of the t types of people you're referring to, and we'll never get a satisfactory answer. But I think just down to the, the question I asked that you're talking about in my notes, when has freedom ever been bad for markets? Just in a basic sense. The answer is never. There's never been a time where increased freedom. Hence, they're called free markets. Well, that's what, that's what we were kind of brought up to believe here, right, in terms of our beliefs about American private enterprise. Now, within the U.K., I do believe if Brexit were what its opponents have said, it would be bad for markets if it represented a wall to doing more trade. I think the opposite. I think U.K. negotiating their own trade deals will lead to greater trade, and I think that there is absolutely, there's tons of precedent in other other countries. But I just want to point out, and I'm not going to get into specifically Lloyd Blankfein, but other critics of Brexit said the exact same thing when UK wouldn't join the euro currency. Right. It saved their economy. It saved their country that they didn't join that debacle of a currency 20 plus years ago. But if, even with all this said and done, you, you could still say Europe at large remains unattractive. It on remains uninvestable from a risk reward standpoint. Now, one of the things that I think could happen is a big unexpected bout of monetary stimulus, and that would absolutely spark their markets. It just kicks the can further. I don't want them to do that, but I don't think it's off the table. I mean, when Draghi talked about the bazooka, what's it been now? Seven years ago, he meant it. Yeah. And, and so, what, uh, to me, the issue of them trying to go more fiscal stimulus, markets respond negatively. It doesn't work. They're not willing to do what they really need to do to cure what ails the European economy. So for us, there's no scenario I see where things go really well in Europe and don't go really well in America. So that uh, exposure we would normally have to European equities as global investors, we just are a little more U.S. heavy in that sense. So, John, are you, you're listening. Are you... You nodding or, or rolling your eyes? <laughs> uh, to a degree, I'm nodding, Joe. Good morning. Good morning. I think that there's a distinction we've got to keep in mind, right? Look at the way the market is the market getting complacent. You think about what happened in June 16 to the pound sterling, as well as to the global equity markets on the announcement of Brexit, and then you see the way the markets perform this week. So uh, while uh, the other the other guest has very good points, David does. I think it's important to keep in mind that the impact of uncertainty on future investment. And that's, that's why we're concerned. And it sounds like David is also concerned about Europe. Uh, not only is it the uncertainty of Brexit that could slow down personal consumption as well as business investment, but we have slowing growth in Germany. We have certainly the Italian debt situation, which uh, really is a big deal when you consider the, the two extremes and coalition governments trying to trying to get everything together. And it's the third or fourth largest credit market in the world. So we're actually more concerned about Italy than we are than we are Brexit. In terms of, of the markets here, David, let me just summarize quickly what you're saying. They're, they're, last month, when things were pessimistic, uh, there was really, if you look into the abyss, there was nothing necessarily there to account for it. Even though we've now we've come back a little bit, there are significant headwinds, but things overall are, are didn't, don't really explain a 20% drop or whatever it was in certain... That, that's right. So let me bifurcate with two things. Fang having about 40% come out from peak to trough, I can justify all day on a valuation okay. basis. You know, these multiple... That was what scared me so much is some of those companies dropped 40% and then were trading at 100 times earnings. So Fang is sort of a separate story. But within the broader market, particularly the dividend growth stuff that we do at Bonson Group... It, to me, I, if those issues with the Fed, they really do blink, which it appears that they are blinking. You say no, no hikes or cuts 
in 2019. That's our forecast, and it's clearly what the Fed Fund's futures market is saying as well. Um, and it's a kind of lifetime thesis of mine. I don't think any Fed is ever going to shock markets again. So the Fed futures are going to give you a better indication. But the other issue I, I refer to is the trade war, and business investment did collapse in the last quarterly GDP print. It was so large in fourth quarter 17 and first and second quarter 18, that CapEx investment that I think we got out of President Trump tax reform and some deregulation, all these good things, it collapsed. And there's no explanation to me other than businesses hitting the brakes around the threats of the trade war. That needs to be resolved, but I also believe it's going to be resolved. Okay. Okay, John. Uh, similar thoughts with these? I'm sorry you have to keep responding to David like he's the grand poobah, but, um, but what, what are you thinking? Uh, I, I think David's correct on the capital investment standpoint. We grew about 10 percent in the first half of the year, and as the trade uncertainty escalated, it ground to a halt. And unfortunately, we may not have the data now on January 30th like we're expecting for fourth quarter GDP. But nonetheless, we really believe that the Federal Reserve, we don't look for a cut this year, but they have several other tools they can use, right? They can apply a pause, they can announce a pause, then they can pause. Uh, there are a variety of things to go on. But I do believe they're going to maintain... Uh, balance sheet reduction, which, as you all know, will have an upward uh, uh, bias on market interest rates, and we think that'll be a positive for the economy, pointing toward continued growth in the two and a half percent range in 2019. So, end of uh, are the highs of the S and P this year, John, in your view, will, will be just approximately. Do you? Do you yeah, I, I think we can finish up the year near a new high. It typically takes about a year to repair the technical damage like we've experienced if you look at the last hundred years of bear markets. Um, but if we've made 10 percent back, right, but I think yeah. we'd all agree that was the easy 10 percent because we just dropped like a rock. There was no base camps. Uh, what now we really have to count on the Fed. We have to count on profitability, uh, a path toward progress on trade. And then when you get that sort of clarity, I think that's when uh, equities will respond. It may not take a whole year, and here's the two precedents I'm using. You remember August of 98, S&P dropped 20% mm -hmm. in a month for a lot of the very similar situations we have now. Uh, the Fed completely blinked, and you had the markets really rally hard in less than one quarter. But then just go back three years ago, January of 16, worst January in the history of the market. And, and we reversed by end of February, and markets are making new highs by summertime. So I think that those two precedents are a lot more like what's going on now. It was not a recessionary correction. It was much more technical and, and short-lived and cyclical in that sense. Okay, David. David Bonson, uh, inventor of the Bonson Burner and the Bonson Group, yep. and uh, John Lynch of LPL Financial.